I'm really happy to introduce introduce Nicola Richmond, who is the VP of AI from Benevolent AI. Um, and her lightning talk will be all about the Benev Benevolent platform, um, which augments scientific ingenuity um, with AI to navigate an ever expanding data landscape to map complex diseases. So I'll hand it over to you, Nicola. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you yep. perfectly well. Great. And yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak today and the kind introduction. So um, I'm Nicola Richmond, VP of AI at Benevolent AI, and I'm delighted to be part of this event focusing on AI adoption in the UK. Um, what I'm going to do um, over the next 10 minutes is share a case study with you where we've used large language models to discover novel drug targets. And next slide, please. Um, so Benevolent AI has um, evolved into a clinical stage AI drug discovery company and we really have a unique and differentiated approach where we harness AI to decipher complex disease biology, discover novel drugs and tackle some of the most significant challenges facing pharmaceutical R&D. If you go on to the next slide please. Oh, one before, yeah, no, uh, one before, yeah, that one, please, thanks. So, um, yeah, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the pharmaceutical R&D um, model and the challenges facing that model, um, but basically discovering medicines is really, really difficult. It takes around 10 years and an average cost of $2.6 billion to bring a drug to the market, and for every 100 molecules that enter clinical development, around 90 of those will fail. And over half of those failures happen in phase two when you're testing your molecule in the patient for the very first time. Um, and furthermore, for the top selling drugs, they don't actually work very effectively for a significant minority of patients taking them. And a key reason for um, this failure is really a lack of understanding of the underlying disease biology. And this often translates to a poor choice of drug target. And by drug target, think of some kind of protein in the body that's not functioning properly and that um, dysfunction is causing disease. And what we hope to do with a, a great drug target is recover that function with uh, a novel medicine and thereby um, remediate uh, the symptoms of disease. Now, selecting the right target is the first step in this very long process, the drug discovery and development process. And it's arguably the most important. If you get this decision wrong, then regardless of how good your downstream process is, you, you're likely to fail. Next slide, please. So at Benevolent AI, we've addressed um, these issues by creating a comprehensive view of disease biology with our data foundations comprising over 85 diverse data sources, including millions of peer-reviewed papers that we interrogate with our in-house suite of AI-based tools. Our platform is incredibly versatile. We can work on any disease with any drug modality, and by that I mean a small molecule or an antibody, and we can identify novel disease targets that support both internal programs but also external collaborations, and I'll touch on some platform proof points in later slides. So next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you an overview of um, how we use our platform to systematically identify novel therapeutic targets. And what I want you to um, imagine is that we have the human expert firmly in the loop here. So we start um, using our in-house tools and data to formulate a biological question. And you can see an example of that in uh, the left upper left-hand quadrant. So can we treat ALS by reversing autophagy impairment in microglia by reducing oxidative stress. So this uh, biological question has some key um, 
information in there, it specifies the disease, an endpoint that we might measure, a cell type, a mechanism, and how we want to modulate that mechanism. In, and in this case, it's reduction. And then we take that biological question and we feed that question to our suite of AI models. And those models uh, rank the entire genome. So they rank biological targets with the ones at the top, most likely being those that will answer the biological question that the models have received. Now, I've already mentioned that we have the um, the human expert in the loop. So the next step in our process, so I'm now on bottom left quadrant three, and we present this list to our drug discovery scientists who then go through and, and look at each target and assess each target alongside the evidence that we surface to support that target for biological plausibility and targets that make it through that initial biological plausibility triaging process will then be assessed against other progressibility criteria. And those criteria are typically safety. So is it safe to modulate this target if we were to find a drug? Is the target even druggable? And how novel is this target? Is it known to everybody or is it something new? And there's an opportunity to differentiate. Targets that make it through that process are then sent to a validation assay that we either run um, at our labs in Cambridge or we partner with um, CROs. And then we take all the evidence that we've accumulated throughout this process for targets that are successfully validated in assays. And we combine these evidence and th these evidence packages are then reviewed for portfolio entry. And by that, I mean that we're then ready to actually begin the search for a potential drug. Um, so if you can go on to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, the previous one. Yeah, so this slide is very similar. I just wanted to highlight that one of the methodologies that we use in our suite of models is um, large language models. And I'm gonna talk about that in more detail on the next slide. So if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, uh, you need to go back one, back another one. Back one more, please. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. So um, I don't know how many of you remember a game in the 80s, a televised game called Blankety Blank presented by Terry Wogan. So um, contestants would be given a sentence with a, a word or um, a phrase blanked out and they would have to guess uh, what's uh, underneath the, the blank. Um, and this is essentially what we're using um, a large language model, specifically a transformer architecture to do. Although this time the sentences that we give our model are from the biomedical literature and we systematically mask out or blank out the particular target. So essentially what we're doing is training our model to play blankety blank. And at the beginning of training, when the model parameters are randomly initialized, the model is really quite terrible at playing this game. But um, over time, it actually gets quite good at playing blankety blank. And if you go on to the next slide, slide please. Yes, and so a convenient byproduct of this training process is that the model learns a really semantically rich representation of biology. And by that, it, me it learns machine readable vectors that we can use in downstream tasks, such as ranking novel targets. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so for those who are interested in a bit more detail, um, what we do is we take a sentence that you see there. So um, X is a promising novel therapeutic target to decrease oxidative stress in ALS. And um, we push that sentence through the transformer and it learns an embedding of X, which in this case is the blank and we want it to guess a target at this point. And um, what it does is because it's um, been trained to play this blankety blank game and it's um, learned this really semantically rich um, representation of biology, 
the machine readable vector that corresponds to X, so the embedding contains all the context of the sentence that it's surrounded by. And what the model then does is it systematically compares the embedding for X with the embedding of all the other targets in, in the human genome. And it systematically calculates a probability that um, X at a particular target is a great fit for X. Um, and by doing so, we're able to rank the entire genome and then we can present that rank list to our drug discovery scientists. If you go on to the next slide, please. So one, one of the drawbacks with um, large language models and, and many other types of AI models um, is a lack of transparency. And, and this is a key concern for our drug discovery colleagues. So we also use a model to surface evidence to support a particular target. So when they're looking at a ranked list of targets, for each target that they're looking at, um, we can embed um, the, a, a sentence such as the one that I showed on the previous slide, along with the target of interest. So we're getting one of these vectors. We can also embed every sentence in our literature corpus and we can just simply do a distance based comparison of all these sentences in their machine readable vector form and we can surface the closest sentence in this embedding space. And those are usually sentences that are most relevant to that target. So we surface this literature alongside a particular target, thereby providing support and, and um, mitigating some of the concerns about lack of transparency. If you go on to the next slide, please. So I've, I've talked about um, models lacking transparency and the term that we like to use is black box and, and how we deal that through evidence surfacing. There are other valid concerns that our drug discovery colleagues have. One of those is model reliability. Um, so models are not 100% reliable, no matter how well they've been trained. And I've already stated that we have the human expert firmly in the loop. We believe in augmenting the human expert, not replacing the human expert. I've also touched on how we deal with probabilities and some notion of uncertainty rather than absolutes. So that's another way to mitigate reliability concerns. And another um, key issue that is a very challenging one to resolve is the inherent biases in data that we're training our models on. And some of these biases we mitigate through clever normalization strategies within the models themselves. Um, but we also recognize that um, actually there's a, a, a huge diversity um, problem with the data that we typically train on. And just to highlight with a few examples, we have um, amazing resources like the UK Biobank and we have genetics consumer companies like 23andMe. These are fantastic resources, but one problem is that they're um, dominated by patients or um, consumers that are um, of European descent. Um, so we've um, built a tool that really allows us to quantify um, diversity in data and recognizing that that's not really the end of this issue. We've also set up our data diversity initiative to highlight and tackle some of these key challenges. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, which is my last slide, I just wanted to close by um, sharing um, successes that we've had with our platform over the years. So our entire pipeline, which um, currently consists of 15 named platform um, programs and um, over 10 exploratory stage programs, all these drug programs are 100% platform generated. And um, we have assets that are even um, in clinical development. Um, we also have this really thriving collaboration with AstraZeneca that's into its fourth year now. And um, the platform has delivered five targets um, for this collaboration to date in a variety of different diseases. And then um, in the space of 48 hours during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to use our platform to identify an existing FDA approved 
um, drug that um, could be repurposed um, for COVID-19. And we published this and, and Lily, who um, are the, um, the supplier of this um, drug happened to see this publication and they um, fast-tracked a clinical trial and, and this drug was approved to treat um, COVID-19 patients in ICU that had a very poor prognosis and actually reduced mortality by 40%. So uh, that was my last slide. I'm going to end there. I just wanted to say thank you for listening and yeah, happy to take questions when the time is right.